We're going to finish up the third part of this lectures on chapter 22 by talking about various means of membrane transport. Now there are three fundamental types of transport. The first of these is called passive transport. And passive transport is just another name for simple diffusion. And diffusion is the transfer of substances based on concentrations. And so materials in a high concentration area will automatically flow to a lower concentration area while the solvent will flow in the opposite direction until the concentrations between the two um, areas is the same. No energy is used and it is simply everything is, is bulk transfer. The next of these is called facilitated transfer. This is similar to simple diffusion except the transfers of molecules is controlled by portals and but there is no energy used in this process. And then the third is called active transport. And active transport occurs when materials are transferred against the consecration gradient by using energy. And this is an example of such a situation, you basically have a carrier that takes up the molecule, it captures it and moves the molecule through the membrane and releases it on the other side of the membrane. And if this process uses energy in order to accomplish this, it's called active transport. And if it does not use energy, then it's called passive transport or facilitated transport, excuse me. Two other processes that we need to talk about are endocytosis and exocytosis. Endocytosis is the intake of large substances into the cell. If the substance is solid, this is called phagocytosis, pictured here on the, on the left, phagocytosis. And if the substance is liquid, then it is called pinocytosis, pictured here on the right. Exocytosis is the reverse of endocytosis and it's the expelling of materials uh, into the environment. Cellular movement is accomplished a few different ways. One way is the use of a large whip-like structure at the end of the cell called a flagella. If you look at a picture of an organism called a euglenia, one of the characteristic features of the euglenia is that it has a large flagella which it uses to move around. The other is called cilia, which is pictured on this paramecium here. You have these little hair-like structures, and here it shows them in magnification, and they are somewhat like oars, and they basically stroke through and move the, the organism through the um, environment. Now, we're going to finish up by talking about the cell cycle and the division of cells known as mitosis. So the cell cycle starts with a process known as interphase. Interphase is the time between two replications and it is the time when the DNA is replicated and stored in the chromatin and the chromosomes are also replicated. And so as I said, the, the interphase is defined as that time between two cellular divisions. The chromosomes within the cell are the structures that contain the two DNA molecules uh, of the cell. And mitosis is, occurs when the nucleus divides into two separate nuclei, both of which have a full complement of DNA. And when the cell actually divides, mitosis is when the nucleus divides. When the cell actually divides, it's called cytokinesis. Now during mitosis you have, you start with unreplicated chromosomes here on the left with its tightly co uh, coiled DNA and then the, D the DNA itself replicates and forms two paired chromosomes which are connected at a site known as the cy centromere. And you notice you have one chromosome here, unreplicated, and a green one and a reddish one here. And after the replication of the DNA, you have two paired DNA strands which are identical to each other and they're connected at the centromere. 
And so in the initial phase of this process of mitosis is called prophase. In the prophase, the spindle apparatus forms, and I'll show you on the next slide exactly how this occurs. Metaphase is the next part that occurs, and again, in subsequent slides, I'm going to show you exactly what happens. And the last of these is called anaphase. So let's look at each of these individually. So in prophase, you have the DNA, which is tightly packaged into, into chromosomes. and in the early part of DNA, these chromosomes begin to get s s shorter and denser. And so you can see them uh, more easily under the microscope. At the same time, the nucleolus, which was right here, is, dis is dismantled and taken away. The centromere, which is this, this, this centrosome moved opposite sides, they come from the centromere. Excuse me, let me say that again. The centromeres move to opposite sides of the cell here, and then there'll be one over on this side. So you can see here's, here's the two of them together, and then one stays here, and the other one moves over here to the other side. And eventually, they'll be opposite each other. One will be on this side of the cell, and the other will be on this side of the cell. And the spindle apparatus forms from these centr centromeres and centrosomes and will attach themselves to the, to the chromosomes. And then lastly, the nuclear envelope basically falls apart. Then in metaphase, the spindle apparatus is now on each end of the cell. There's one here, and you'll notice these two perpendicular, the way the centromeres look, on each end of the cell, of the cell nucleus. We're talking about the cell nucleus here. And the chromosomes have now lined up in the center of, or the equator of the cell. And then, and then the spindles reach out and grab each of these chromosomes right at the, center, at the uh, centromere. The last is called the, before the cell separates, the last is called the anaphase. And you'll notice that each of the single chromosomes now separates from its partner and they are dragged into opposite ends of the cell. And then in the middle, the, the nucleus begins to divide into two nuclei. 